what have you. So, uh, about eight years ago, uh, when I came to New Life, uh, maybe a couple of weeks into my time here, um, I heard Ephraim uh, Smith preach here. And when I heard him preach, I remember exactly where I was sitting. I was sitting in the balcony right up top there, and I was immediately just captivated uh, by his passion, by his ability to bring uh, Christ to people. And I told him, you know, he, he preached, he gave this metaphor of the Impala as, uh, as a just beautiful metaphor for Christian spirituality. And to this day, I remember it. Uh, he has served as the founding pastor of the Sanctuary Covenant Church, uh, the president of the Sanctuary Community Development Corporation in Minnesota, uh, the superintendent of the Pacific a Southwest Conference of the ECC, the Evangelical Covenant Church, and currently uh, he serves as the president and CEO of World Impact, which is an urban missions organization committed to the empowerment of the urban poor through the facilitation of church planning movements and leadership development. Now, throughout this day already, we've heard from Ephraim um, some stuff on the stage here at the breakout. But now he's going to close our day. He's going to be our Carl Lewis, just running the anchor leg here and bringing us home. And so uh, we gave Gabriel a rousing ovation. We gave Kathy a rousing ovation. We gave Pete a rousing ovation. Uh, Ephraim, uh, he's going to close the day. And so you're probably a little more tired here. But we're going to close by giving him a crazy welcome as well, just letting him know that we are grateful that he's here. And we are opening our ears to what God's going to speak to us. And so... Uh, give it up for Ephraim as he comes up here. Tonight. I uh, want to point us to a word in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, verse 4. I figured I used to be a Baptist preacher, so I better just jump in, because if I do an introduction, it'll, it'll take too long. John 4, beginning with verse 4. And he, Christ, had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. From this text, I want to talk to you uh, on the title, Reconciliation as Empowerment. Reconciliation as Empowerment. I am really into superhero movies. No, no, really. I, I, I know next month Batman v Superman is coming out uh, in March here. And uh, there's going to be this, this battle between Batman and Superman. There's going to be cameos by Aquaman and Wonder Woman and Cyborg. And that's going to set up two years later part one of the Justice League. Now, that's not going to outdo that right after that, we're going to get Captain America Civil War, which is going to have this epic battle of an army of superheroes led by Captain America versus an army of superheroes led by Iron Man. There's going to be an appearance by Black Panther, and there's going to be an appearance by Spider-Man, and uh, that is going to set up the third reboot of Spider-Man. That's also going to set up the next Avengers, Affinity Gauntlet, in 2018 and 2020 where there's this villainous Thanos who wants to take over the entire universe with an infinity glove and six infinity stones. Also in November you're going to get a Doctor Strange movie. Uh, you're also going to get solo movies uh, by Green Lantern, Aquaman, Wonder Woman coming out. And so this, I, this is like incredible and I do know some stuff about the Bible too. But I'm, I'm really into superhero movies as you can tell. This really goes back to my childhood, and, and even today, I'm really into comic books as well. So I don't know if part of emotionally healthy spirituality, reading comics, if that counts. But anyway, I, I read comic books, and so my, my favorite comic book uh, series is a Superman series called Bizarro World. 
And the story arc of the version of Bizarro World that I have goes something like this. There's this other place, this other realm known as Bizarro. And it's a wicked, upside down, broken world. And Bizarro World is so wicked, so upside down, so broken that there's a person in Bizarro World who looks just like Superman, except he's as evil as Superman is good. And the wickedness and the sin and the brokenness and the upside down state of Bizarro World is threatening to invade planet Earth. Now, to go with this storyline, you have to believe that on planet Earth, for the most part, things are good. There's, there's stable families, there's good community, there's, there's good government, good, good economy, the church is just doing fabulous. It's bizarro world that is wicked and sinful and broken and upside down. But, but the truth is, sisters and brothers, we live in bizarro world. This, this world that we live in is, is a broken, upside down world. Yes, there are places where there's good community and good families and peace, but there are far too many places where there's racial division and human trafficking and poverty and homelessness and a broken economy and a dysfunctional politics. There are too many places where violence is the primary means to solve conflict. We live in a bizarro, broken, sinful, upside down world. Ah, but here's the good news. Over 2,000 years ago, someone greater than any comic book superhero hero ever written about. His name is Jesus. Came down here and when Jesus came into this upside down world he gave us a picture of what this upside down world could look like if it was turned right side up again. He called that the kingdom of God and he, he declared the kingdom of God and he demonstrated the kingdom of God and I wonder if that's what's going on here in John chapter 4 that once again Jesus is giving us a picture of what this upside down world could look like if it was turned right side up again. The work of racial reconciliation is kingdom work. It's liberating work. It's transformative work. It is, it's empowering work that takes what is upside down and gives us a picture of right side up relationships right side up community, right side up systems and structures, right side up church. Jesus, it says here in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, had to go to Samaria. But that's not true, is it? I mean, all kinds of religious leaders avoided Samaria. People that believed they had an intimate relationship with God, that believed they were tight with God, that they were the voice of God, that they were the articulator of God's word, that they were the interpreter of God's will, avoided Samaria. And in avoiding Samaria, they increased, they widened the chasm between people groups, specifically Jewish people and Samaritans, yet Jesus had to go there for the purpose of transformation, truth, and empowerment. If we are going to live out reconciliation as empowerment, we have to go to the places Christ goes. That's the first point. As a reconciler, are you willing to go to the places other people avoid? Some people don't want to go into the topic of racial division. They avoid it. That's what color blindness is about. It's about avoiding the places where God goes. Some people don't even want to have a conversation about human trafficking. I mean, they can't even imagine a child being trafficked, even though I live in the Bay Area of Northern California, which is one of the top metropolitan areas where girls between the ages of 8 and 13 are kidnapped, and within 48 hours, they're be somewhere in a nasty hotel room being beaten and raped, and then they're put on the street somewhere like Las Vegas as a prostitute. Nobody wants to go there, but we must go to the places, to the issues, to the topics that other people avoid, even the topics and the places that some church people avoid. 
that some Christian people avoid. Jesus went to a place where people that thought they knew God really good wouldn't go. To sit with a person that people that thought they really knew God wouldn't associate with. Here he is. Are we willing to follow God to the places others avoid? This is the work of reconciliation. But it's not just that Jesus went, it's how he went. The Bible says when he got there, he was tired. Weary, the son of God, God in human form, went to Samaria vulnerable. And he sat down at the well. By the time the Samaritan woman gets to the well, God in human form is in a lowered position. Are we willing to go into the division, into the dysfunction, into the, into the mess of race, humbly? Are we willing to go low? Some people go into racism defensive. Some people go arrogant and prideful, uh, uh, angry, uh, uh, emotion on 10. This is not easy, especially if you've been oppressed by racism. But at some point, we have to go even into the places that have oppressed us as Jesus went. You don't think Jesus understood oppression? Jesus comes into the world and every baby that looks like him is murdered. They have to leave and become refugees, uh, undocumented people in Egypt. Jesus, they, they said, he didn't even grow up in the right neighborhood. His community had a stigma. What good can come from where Jesus came from growing up as a human being? I mean, the way he was ridiculed, if Jesus can be oppressed and minority and, and, and marginalized and yet be loving and humble and a servant, so can I. Will we go to the places that others avoid following Jesus and go as Jesus went? He went low. This had to be so awkward for the Samaritan woman. A Jewish man putting himself in a lower position in a society that said she was the low. If you were a woman in the culture at that time, at best you were a second class citizen. If you were a diseased woman, you were an outcast. Or the thought was, what did she do to be cursed like that? If you were a Samaritan woman, Lord have mercy. And yet they meet at the well. He says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one now that is not your husband, what you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Not only must we follow Christ as reconcilers to the places that others avoid, we must follow Christ into the work of reconciliation for new identity and new worship. We must follow Christ into a new identity and a new worship. Huh. You know, sometimes I've heard preachers preach this text and they individualize it. They take the, the, the Samaritan woman being married five times 
and they take the, the fact that she's living with a guy that it, she's not married to, and they make this story about individual sin that points towards an individual like her needing salvation. So we can look at the fact that she's been married five times and divorced. We can look at the fact that she's shacking with her boyfriend. And then we can look out at the audience of the parishioners and say, what have you done? And make the person individually look at their own sins and then have to wrestle with the need for salvation. There's actually nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you do with this text, you have not completed its context. You have not done good exegesis. You have not gotten into the holistic nature of the hermeneutic beauty that is pouring out of this text. If you just make it about that. Because her being married five times and divorced and living with a guy, that is tied to her life choices. But it's also tied to systems, to an institution, to a cultural framework around a woman's place in the process of covenant marriage at the time. In some places, according to scholars, uh, a woman didn't even have a, a, a big say in her marriage. A guy could just go to the father of the woman he wanted to marry, who in that culture might be 13, 14, 15 years old, and say to the father, I want to marry her, and they could work out a deal. Did, haven't you seen stories in the Old Testament where, where, you know, where a guy goes to a dad and says, I want to marry her? And he goes, well, I can give you her, but I want you to take her sister first. If you take her sister first, maybe I'll give you her too. And the woman ain't really saying, hey, wait a minute. I mean, could you imagine sisters, you know, getting married like that? You know, your dad just come to you and say, hey, me and this guy right here, we just worked this out, and this is going to be your husband. Don't worry about it. He don't have all his teeth. Look, he a good man. He got some land. I know he has one eye, but he's a good man. Me and him have talked. We was playing dominoes. And I said, you know, you'd be good for my daughter. Don't, don't worry about the eye. Just, just look away. Don't worry about the eye. So, and so not only did you have a marriage culture where a woman may not have a lot of say in who her husband would be, but then men could divorce women over frivolous reasons. She can't have a child. I mean, that's not frivolous, but what I'm saying is it's frivolous to leave your wife over the fact that she might not be able to, not, not, not only is it like she can't bear a child naturally, but like if all she had was daughters and never gave you a son. You, you could just over some just, just over some reasons that were selfish and just had to do with guy culture that had to do with dysfunctional masculinity. You could throw a woman away. We don't even know this woman's name, so why do you assume you know her story? I mean, people can just read this text and just throw the Samaritan woman under the bus. You don't even know her name. It didn't say Esther. It didn't say Vashti. It just said Samaritan woman. Could it be that we have this issue in the United States of America where we judge the other, where we throw the poor under the bus because we think we know their story? You don't know all black people. You don't know all Latinos and Latinas. You don't even know all the white people in your family. You don't even know all the black people in your own family. You got cousins you don't even know. How you gonna know a whole nother race of people? You don't even know your own people. <laughs> you, 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 you got relatives you don't want to know. <laughs> I ain't gonna tell nobody. But you, you got people that like, they can come for dinner, but not for overnight. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and they're your family members. So if you don't even know, if, regardless of your ethnicity, if you don't know your own relatives all that good, how are you going to make comments on social media about a whole race of people? So you know everybody in Ferguson. You didn't even been in Ferguson. <laughs> you, you don't say, I know how the police are in Ferguson. No, you don't. <laughs> I know how, no, you don't. I don't even know how all Christians are. I don't even know how all pastors are. We don't know her story. I'm, I'm not saying we excuse that she was married five times, but maybe she's been thrown away five times. 
And she's like, you know, I tried the marriage thing. I've been thrown away five times. This guy is my boyfriend. What's the worst that can happen? At least I won't be ridiculed in the public. At least they won't say, another one left you? Something wrong with her. I'm not excusing her behavior. I'm saying there are individual and systemic ramifications around ethnic, racial, cultural, and gender division. But yet here's Jesus sitting low at the well with her. Because uh, there's nothing that said Jesus got up yet. Jesus could still be, you know what I'm saying? I, I, as far as I know, because it doesn't get that detailed. So how do we know she's not still standing, Jesus is not still sitting, having this conversation? And I don't think Jesus is just guilt tripping her. You've been married five times. Because look at her response. Her response isn't, I'm out of here. How dare you judge me? Who are you? She says to him, you must be a prophet. Because she's amazed that he knows everything in her mailbox. Like, how do you know that? People like you don't even come down here. So how would you know who I'm married to or who I live with? People like you don't even come down here. And they didn't have CNN. So Don Lemon and Anderson Cooper wasn't reporting on what she was doing because they didn't have no cable. Nobody was tweeting that she's a nasty woman, been married five times, because they didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. How would Jesus know? Because they went down there and got low. If you want to know my story and my pain, come to my town and get low. And if I want to know your story, I got to go to your town and get low. What if all Christians went into the spaces of other people and got low? Maybe God would be lifted high. But she skips the subject on this marriage thing. She said, she said hey, let's talk about something else. Um, what about worship? You worship on the mountain. We worship in the valley. What about that? And Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Reconciliation is about the transformation of identity. I, I, when I became a Christian, my skin did not change. It didn't. I'm still Milky Way, Three Musketeer Bar, <laughs> chocolate. Then when, I, when they put me down in the water, because I'm Baptist, so you know there's no sprinkle where I come from. When they put me down and held me and I came up, I'm still like this. <laughs> but from the inside out, I am a new creature. I'm, my citizenship is in the kingdom of God. I am now related by blood shed on Calvary to my friends and my enemies in Christ Jesus. I am intimately related by blood shed on Calvary to the ignorant, the prideful, the selfish, the narcissistic, the compulsive, the paranoid, the, the codependent, the mean, I'm still brown skin. I'm still African American. But there is something transformative that has taken place. And that transformation on the inside ought to expand my taste buds for worship on the outside. Amen. We need a church that will tear down on some levels a rigid, siloed, racialized worship. It doesn't mean that I have to give up Negro spirituals and urban gospel music. 
It doesn't mean I can't like Kirk Franklin and Yolanda Adams anymore. It doesn't mean I have to stop liking Lecrae. It just means that I'm bringing my worship taste buds to the buffet of kingdom worship. It's a potluck meal. When I was pastor, we used to have this meal quarterly where I told people they had to bring a dish representing their upbringing or their culture. And so we had the enchiladas next to the fried rice, next to the collard greens, next to the hot dish, next to the, 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 the pot pie. I mean, we had it. And, and there, we said no chitlins, though. Couldn't bring no chitlins <laughs> and couldn't bring no lutefisk. Those were the two things you couldn't bring. Everything else, we even let kimchi in. So, I mean, I was, you know, we was really... We was really being loving, you know what I'm saying? But no chitlins. I was a little mad that they let kimchi in, but I couldn't be no chitlins, but I got over it. We just said, well, I'm just bringing extra collard greens then, catfish. And so, and I said to people, the same way we're digesting one another's foods, we have to digest one another's pain and story. We have to bear one another's burdens. And you know how people are when they go to a potluck. The food that they, uh, you know, they, they know because they had it before and they know who made it. They put a lot of that on there. And then there's other food they just put a little bit because they ain't never ate it before. They don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to let you in on a little black secret, okay? I'm this little black secret. This, I'm not going to give them all to you now, but I'll give you one little black secret. We always want to know who made the potato salad. Like, you know, we like, okay, I see some potato salad. Who made the potato salad? Did, did, uh, who did? Did Shaquita, okay, Shaquita made the potato salad. How old is Shaquita? Who her mama is? You know, we always, black people want to know this. Who made the potato salad? And why is it orange? I mean, that's the kind of stuff we want to know. It's black people, this is important. If potato salad ain't your thing, don't bring it to no church dinner. I mean, in your emotionally healthy spirituality, pastor, you need to like lay out conditions for potato salad or you can, it's going to blow up on you. I'm just saying, it's gonna, the whole thing going to blow up. Oh, where was I? Okay, now. Where was I? <laughs> we have to be willing to let God expand our taste buds for worship. I have been in worship at an all Latino, Latina church. I don't know Spanish that well but I know the Holy Ghost. And my spirit tells me when something's of God. So just, just bob your head. You don't know the word, just, just do something. Clap on one and three, it's all right, just something. Just do something. Let God expand your taste buds. This is the last thing about, I'm gonna say about taste buds. If, if you've experienced something cross-culturally that was good to you, don't act like when you get back around your own people like it's nasty. You know, okay, so one time I was down in Louisiana. My dad's from Monroe, Louisiana. And so I was at my cousin O'Rail's house, and my cousin O'Rail and my cousin Cooter, they were like barbecuing. Uh, and so cousin O'Rail, cousin Cooter was barbecuing. So don't look at me like these ain't normal names. And so they barbecuing. And so I, I'm, I was a kid, okay? So I shouldn't have done this. When they weren't at the grill, I went and I took a piece of the chicken off the grill and I put it in my mouth. And then something hit me in the back of my head and it was my cousin O'Rail. Almost knocked me unconscious. I think this is abuse. But um, so when I came to myself, I said, I'm sorry, Cousin O'Rell. She said, that's all right, baby, but don't just go. I did that because I don't want you to burn yourself. I ain't mad at you that you ate the meat because you can eat whatever you want when you're here, but, uh, but I didn't want you to burn yourself. So that's why I had to pop you upside your head. <laughs> said, okay. So she said, how did you like it? I said, this is the best chicken I ever ate. She said, this ain't no chicken, that's armadillo. <laughs> ago I was going, this is the best chicken I ever ate in my life. This is some good chicken right here. Mm. When I knew what it was, then I was like, uh, mm, mm. I want to spit it out. It didn't stop being good. Now, there's only two ways you can get armadillo, as far as I know. You, you can't go to Cub or Safeway or, you know, 
piggly wiggly, and you ain't get no rainbow. You ain't get no. The only way I know you you hit it or you hunt it. That's the only two ways I know you can get armadillo. You hit it or you hunt it. This is what I say that to say this. If you taste something in the body of Christ cross culturally that's good to you, don't change your mind when you find out who wrote it. When you find out who the architect was. You know, for 30 days in February, we get to find out what black people invented. You know, ain't that funny? Black people, we, in February, for 29 days, we go, black people made the stoplight? Black people made skipping peanut butter? What? What? I thought they just picked cotton. They picked peanuts too. What? No black people invented no. But they invented jelly too. Finding out that God used somebody different than you to create something is a vehicle to worship a God that's bigger than you. So that we can be the church. So that we can be the church. So at the end here, um, the woman leaves her water pot, verse 28. And she went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Verse 39 says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Not only must we follow Christ to the places that others avoid, follow Christ into a new identity, into new worship, but reconciliation is about following God into a revolutionary movement. You know, when Jesus comes back, this is ultimate justice. When Jesus comes back, he will take this upside down, bizarro world, and in full, it will be right side up. We will experience ultimate justice. But sisters and brothers, until then, it's just us. When Jesus comes back, it's justice. Until then, it's just us. God could have done it any way God wants to, but God decided that the frontline vehicle for reconciliation, truth, justice, and transformation is through you and I, the beloved children of God. Amen.